today we're going to be talking about is the housing market about to collapse? So this is a question people have been asking me since COVID hit. If you're not familiar with my channel, I am a lender. I'm a mortgage lender. It's what I do every single day is I watch the housing market. I help people get loans and I started in the business in 2007. So I had a front row seat to the economic housing disaster of the early 2000s. So today I'm going to be talking to you about three reasons the housing market is not going to collapse. Now for anyone who's going, she's a lender, she's biased. No, because here's the thing. If the housing market actually collapsed, my business would double. Yeah, it would double. And the reason is because I grew up, grew up in that era of crisis, I am a ninja with government loans and I know my investment loans inside and out. And if you ever have a housing crisis or a housing collapse, the two things that are going to shine through are going to be government loans, your VA and FHA and investment properties. So if the housing market collapsed, I would actually make more money. Okay. So why do I think it's not going to? Let's talk about those three factors. And I held off on doing this video because I wanted to make sure that any information I was giving you guys was well thought out, informed, and I had enough data to really feel comfortable with what I, I was saying. There's a ton of YouTubers who have been out saying, oh, everything's on fire, wait to buy, you know, don't do this, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't necessarily do research, they just went straight to what could happen. And I would argue that until recently, we didn't have enough data to make that determination. So three big reasons. The first one's an easy one, and we did have this data. So in 2008, 2007, prior to that, the types of loans that lenders were doing to a large extent were extremely predatory. You were doing stated income loans. So what is that? How does that work? So you would go to a lender and you'd say, hey, I really want this beautiful $600,000 house. They would say, okay, no problem. You make 15,000 a month, right? And you'd go, yeah, I make 15,000. Well, I make eight, no, you make 15, right? Okay, I can't wait, but do it as cheesily as that. And the lender would be filling out an application and it was all stated, meaning whatever you said, the lenders and underwriters would treat as a fact. There was no verification. There was no pay stubs. There was no W-2s. There was no calling the employer. There was none of that. None of it. Yeah, that, the bulk of the loans were stated income loans. So you had a bunch of people in houses they didn't qualify for, okay? It gets worse, it gets worse. They were in adjustable rate mortgages, generally that would adjust pretty quick. So you would start out at a very low introductory or teaser rate, and then within year two or three, it would start to go up. Okay. And it had prepayment penalties. So if the interest rate was going up and you wanted to get out, you'd have to pay like 10 or $20,000 in a prepayment penalty in order to get out of that loan. Right? So it had been working okay while houses had equity, but when the equity disappeared, everyone was hosed because they couldn't get out of those loans with the rates that were climbing. Um, and they had never qualified for anything beyond the introductory or, or teaser rate. That's all they had qualified for. So the moment that payment inched up, they were toast. Okay. Those loans are banned. Those loans have not been in the market since 2008. Um, they're gone. There's no stated income. The loans we do now, income, assets, everything is verified. I also feel like, you know, we have so many millennials coming into the market and they are amazing researchers. They don't want to get in over their heads. You know, I have people who know their debt to income before we calculate it. It's great. So it's a very different world than it was back then. Every single borrower, income, assets, tax returns, Everything has been verified. And since COVID, it's gotten even tighter. So lenders are not loosey-goosey, and it was that loosey-goosey that really contributed and fed the crash of earlier 2000s, okay? So we don't have those loans. Number two, and this is the one I hesitated on and why I wanted to see how it would play out more. So COVID, job loss, uh, people not being able to make their mortgage payments, that definitely could lead to a housing collapse had the government not intervened. The government 
when COVID hit, they intervened aggressively and they've continued to support people. So we have, you know, all the stimulus packages and I am not saying that that makes up for people's income, but they also have forbearance. At first it was six months where you don't have to make your mortgage payments if you've been affected by COVID. Then it got extended again and then Biden extended it last month yet again. So. I think the government's looking at this whole picture trying to avoid a housing crisis and the way they've done it is by subsidizing the pain from the COVID job loss um, and all the shutdowns, okay? And that's because they've made it so people don't have to make their payments so that they don't become foreclosures, okay? There's been foreclosure morat moratoriums, all of this legislation to try to prevent what happened in 2008. Now. From my perspective, I was like, okay, but this, this can still blow up. <laughs> like, it's great the government's doing all this, but this can still blow up. Because my concern was, okay, once you've stopped making your payments, when you go back to making payments, what's gonna happen with that money you didn't pay? So most people didn't understand that if they went into forbearance, that interest and payments were still accruing and would have to be settled some way or another. People thought it was just a pause on the mortgage, but that is not what it was. No, payments and interest were still accruing. So had lenders determined that once forbearance was over, you owed the lump sum and you better have it, yes, we would have a ton of foreclosures. But what I have seen is I've seen some pretty creative modifications from lenders. Like for instance, um, there's a national huge bank and what I'm seeing them do is they're taking that lump sum, let's say it's 10,000 in payments and interest you didn't pay, and they're doing it as a silent second on the loan. What is a silent second? A silent second means it's a secondary loan that you're not making payments on. Interest is accruing, but you're not making payments on it. So for people who are worried, oh my gosh, now my payment's gonna go up, I won't be able to afford my house. Well, the silent second made it so that, okay, you're back at work, go back to making your normal payment. If you sell or refinance the house, we'll deal with this money, but just go back to normal, which is great. So that's a save. Um, I have seen some lenders uh, spacing it out over 12 or 24 months, like taking that 10,000 and working it into the payment so that it's just a brief increase. And then I have seen some that are a little bit more aggressive trying to get a lump sum or trying to get it back in three payments, but those are the exception. And I would argue if you're, if what you have one of those lenders, maybe talk to them about if they have some other options such as the silent second or spreading it out over a longer period of time. I've also see, seen lenders change um, um, mortgages so that if it was a 30 year, it's now a 40 year, all to try to keep that payment in the wheelhouse. So the, the lenders are not looking for foreclosures. They don't want foreclosures. Now, what we saw in 2008 is we saw all the foreclosures hit like an avalanche, a tidal wave uh, of foreclosures. And it's because it was the first time it had happened. No one really knew what to do. They had all these loans going sideways. So they just went through the foreclosure process. Now, 2010, 11, 12, and 13, we saw this start to trickle off. And the reason it started to trickle off is everybody wised up. Hey, banks, if everyone hits the market with their foreclosures at once, all you're gonna do is make the debt that you own worth less, which no banks want. They don't want, if they owe, if they have a $500,000 note on a house, they want $500,000. They don't want $300,000. And when they were all title waving the market, all they were doing was taking away value from their notes. So what we started seeing is we started seeing that like people, I would talk to people who hadn't made their payments in three years and the banks had not foreclosed. Why? Well, they don't want to depreciate the value of their note. There were already so many foreclosures to manage. And from a, a property owner perspective, having the person in there maintaining the property is better than having it go vacant and having to have companies, paying companies to come in to maintain it. Mm -hmm. We also saw where people would be like, well, I got cash for keys in 2010, so I think I foreclosed in 2010, and I'll pull the records and see that the bank didn't actually move the property out of their name until 2013, right before they sold it. Okay, there's nothing illegal about any of this. It's just they notice that we have this huge crisis that we are feeding, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna be smart about it. We're gonna trickle them out. 
And that is what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that lenders and the government really learned from the mistakes of 2008 um, and, and onward. And they approached this crisis knowing that. So that was my biggest concern. And the reason I held off on this video is because if you know the forbearances had stopped and it had been a lump sum due, we would see foreclosures everywhere. But the fact that lenders are being creative tells me that they've learned from history and they're not going to repeat that mistake. So number three, um, and number three we're really going to get into on Thursday, supply and demand. Guys, we have a very limited supply and the demand is growing every single day because we have one of the biggest generation of home buyers at home buying age now. So tune in if you're a buyer on Thursday about why it will be a seller's market for five years plus. What are the driving factors? And then next week, we're gonna talk about how to be competitive, free things you can do to be more competitive in a seller's market. So I hope this video was helpful. Um, as always, I am licensed in 46 states. I love doing loans, clearly, and myself and my team would love to help you. Thanks for watching, guys.